Well, here's the equation <clears throat> in uh, uh, shown uh, mathematically, including all the factors I just told you, the factor n, or the result n on the left, that which we are seeking, and all those other factors ending with L, the longevity of civilizations on the right. And what you're looking at here is, in fact, a picture of a plaque at the place where this equation first appeared in a conference room at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in Greenbank, West Virginia, where that first meeting in 1961 was held. And this was the agenda for the meeting. Now, in the 44 years since this came into being, uh, our understanding of these values and what controls them of these factors has changed greatly. And that's what Andy wanted me to talk to you about tonight. What did we think 44 years to ago? And what do we think today or know today in some cases where we knew nothing 44 years ago? And so I'm going to run through this and tell you what discoveries have been made, what clarifications have happened, and as you'll see, there have been some very important breakthroughs, most of them in a positive sense, that is increasing the possibility of there being intelligent life, and certainly some very important discoveries bearing on the nature and existence of life of all kinds, primordial and advanced and technological in the universe. Now, as I said, <clears throat> the whole, whole premise of all of this is that the galaxy has been producing new stars and planets for many, many years. Our sun is 4.5 billion years old, so not the oldest, not the youngest. And by the way, that's an important point. Everything about our system is usual. Nothing special that we have ever discovered about our system. We are not a freak system. We're at, the sun is an average star of average age. We have average amounts of chemical elements. Nothing special, nothing freaky seems to have been involved in our being here. We note in the galaxy the materials of planets, life, that is iron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, are made in the hearts of the stars and released into space as old stars explode, as you see here. There they join the gas and dust clouds of the galaxy, where the gas and dust clouds uh, break off into little fragments, as you can see here in this picture. And some of them, this is a picture from the Hubble telescope, collapse even farther <clears throat> and in time become new stars. And back in 1961, we believed but did not know they became planetary systems. We had a theory. This shows the three steps in uh, the theoretical understanding of how planetary systems come about. You start with a great cloud of dust, it collapses into a rather ragged disk, as you see in step two here, and in time becomes a flattened pancake. We see that more closely here. Uh, <clears throat> a star forms in the center, one gets a huge cloud of debris, which has become a pancake, and the little bits of stuff in the cloud of debris, as they orbit the central star, co coalesce, join together to form ever larger bodies, which in turn collide with one another, sometimes disrupting each other, but in the long run, slowly accumulating into a small number of large bodies, protoplanets, those objects which will become planets. There's a stage shown here, the Titori stage, where, <clears throat> as it's called by astronomers, where this whole system ejects material at high speed out of the center. And uh, this has been the theory, and in fact, this is well supported by observations because we have seen now directly through photographs uh, these disks of dust, disks of accumulating material around almost all of the nearby stars where it's possible to see them. Still, this was, in, 44 years ago, a theory with no observational support. Probably the greatest step ahead which occurred in those 44 years was the direct detection of other planetary systems. Clear evidence of the existence of planetary systems beyond our own, and in fact, planetary systems in large numbers, and providing us with so much information that we learn not only of their existence, but of the nature of planetary systems in general. And as you'll see, this has led to some really astonishing 
possibilities for life in the universe. Almost all of the discoveries so far have come by detecting very small changes in the position of spectral lines in the light that comes from the star, which is the parent of a planetary system. As, the planet orbit, as a planet orbits a star, its gravity pulls on the star and causes the star to do a little wobble in the sky. As that star does the wobble, it introduces a very small Doppler effect, a very small shift in the position of the spectral lines. This has been detected, and from this one can deduce the presence of a planet, what its orbital period is, what its mass is. And in this way, and it's very difficult, evidence for the presence of, at this point, 152, an astonishing number, of other planetary systems have been detected. Most of this was done very near here at the Lick Observatory. This is it in a nice winter scene. Uh, using a rather small telescope, but an extremely powerful and sensitive spectrograph, which is really the heart of the, uh, of the discovery of these extrasolar planets. The small shifts in the spectral line are very hard to detect. It takes a very special spectrograph to detect them. Uh, <clears throat> this is one of the telescopes it licked that, uh, with, which is associated with the spectrograph. It's a three-meter telescope. Many of you have probably seen it. It's many years old. Uh, and uh, it's not one of the largest by far, but until recently, its spectrograph was the best in the world. There is now a better one made by the same person who made the, the spectrometer at Lick, and that one is at the, Mauna, at the uh, <clears throat> Keck Observatory on Mauna Kea. Now we do know that these little wobbles in the, uh, the little wobbles in the spectrum are the result of star of planets orbiting stars, and we know that because now in several cases we have found that we are uh, with some of the systems that the equatorial plane of the uh, orbiting planet is lined up sufficiently with the line of sight to Earth that we actually see eclipses. We see the planet move across in front of the star, dimming some of the light in exactly the way one would expect if an object, say, the size of Jupiter passed in front of a star like our sun. Now, this is proof positive that what we are seeing is truly uh, planets, no doubt about it. In fact, very recently, light from the planets themselves have been detected exactly as expected. And so there's no doubt at all that these 152 systems are extrasolar planets. That tells us uh, that the fraction of stars which have planets, at least deduced from these observations, is at least 50 percent. It is probably more. The present detecting, detection system, this Doppler uh, deviation system, can only detect very massive planets. So in fact, most all of the planets which have been found are very large planets like Jupiter, 300 times the mass of the Earth, uh, and recently down to Saturn and even to Uranus and Neptune masses, but very massive planets, and in most cases uh, surprisingly close to their stars, contrary to what we might have expected. <clears throat> 